Hi, my name is Zach McGee. I'm the chairman of New Media Legal Publishing, the sponsor of this CLE program. The presenter of this program is Andrew Struve. Andy was a brilliant, experienced, and highly successful litigator here in Southern California. On a personal level, he was also a warm, caring, and infectiously funny human being. Sadly, Andy passed away in July 2023 after a brief illness. The program you are about to watch was recorded a few years ago, but I've confirmed that the content still reflects the current state of the law on this topic. Reposting the program allows lawyers like you to continue to benefit from Andy's wisdom, and it allows those of us who knew Andy well to keep him around us for at least a little bit longer. I hope you enjoy it. Hello and thank you for joining. My name is Andrew Struve. I'm a shareholder at Buckhalter PC, um, a general litigation and corporate for firm in uh, California, Arizona, Oregon, Washington. Um, I spent a number of years in so-called big law. And uh, so what I wanted to share with you today is some insights and recommendations and suggestions. So the title of the program is How to Succeed as an Associate in Big Law. First off, the fact that you're taking your time to watch this, I appreciate very much. And it also demonstrates to me that you have an interest in your future and that you want to do something to make it a good future. And so if there's only one or two things, just one or two, that you take away from our talk today, I think it's time well spent. So it'll be 60 minutes of MCLE. We'll go through what we talk about. I'll share with you my personal experiences and I'll share with you recommendations. I do have to preface this by saying that the opinions I express are entirely my own. They're not those of my law firm or any previous law firms and opinions may vary. And so these are just my personal views. So to give you a little bit of background, why I feel like I am perhaps qualified to share these thoughts with you, okay? First of all, this little biography is not intended for my own self-aggrandizement. I uh, like to think I'm fairly self-actualized, but the reason I'm sharing it with you is so you understand the chairs in which I have sat, all right? So I spent 19 years at what would inarguably be called a big law firm, rising from young associate, senior associate, income partner, equity partner, department co-chair, etc. Along the course of the way, and much more, what's much more relevant to you is, what did I do during that time, right? So I did tons of hiring interviews. I, if I had a dollar for every one that I'd done, I uh, would probably go buy a car or something. I started off interviewing summer associates, lateral associates. The summer associate interviewing was something I was most proud of because uh, um, and me and another person I did it with were sort of chartering with making the initial decisions for a time. And I was always pleased as punch when somebody that we hired you know, became an income partner or better yet, an equity partner. That was just a really good feeling because it meant we got it right, right? Um, more relevant to this discussion is I spent 10 years doing associate and senior counsel assignments in litigation. So when somebody needed an associate or a senior counsel to work on a project, and for whatever reason 
had not built their own internal organic relationship. Uh, then you go to management and we do our thing and we pull out the timesheets and we think about who might be the right fit and then we introduce the parties, right? I spent a long time on the associate review committee. It's a lot of work, at least we put a lot of work into it. Really trying to treat people fairly, focusing on equity, focusing on what's just, focusing on spreading opportunity, focusing on making sure that people had comparable chances to shine, if that makes sense. And it's a lot more work than you might think, but I have had binders and binders and binders of associate reviews. And then as an equity partner, I did it for promotions, right? I did it for promotions to income partner. I did it for promotions to equity partner, not just me, a room full of people. Um, I've seen the metrics. I know what I cared about when I made those decisions. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today, okay? So whether you're a first year associate, second year, third year, fifth year, whatever. Um, I'll share with you what mattered to me, and I, I like to think that it was a view that was commonly held by my partners. And I'm deliberately not mentioning any particular firms, I'm deliberately speaking in the abstract. Again, I said these are simply my own views. And again, I want to thank you for hearing them, right? Um, these are just viewpoints, okay? But they're viewpoints born of more years before the mast than uh, I like to count anymore. And what I'm really doing here is I'm going to give you some inside baseball. Okay? Now, why am I doing it? I'm doing it because if I can help just one person who watches this, my Saturday afternoon that could otherwise be spent with my kids or the yacht club, is well spent giving you something that'll help you, okay? Some of the best lawyers I know are people who love to bring up younger people. I used to say that my job would be well done if by the time I retire, I'm the stupidest person in this law firm. That was my goal. That was my goal. If everybody was better than me, I would happily hang my hat and go off to the big island of Hawaii and just have a nice quiet time and call it a job well done. Now, those of you who are watching this program, well, you got those decades to traverse, right? And so how, how do we make it easier for you, right? I mean, that's kind of the message that I want to attempt to convey to you today. I will tell you, and there's a slide deck and we're gonna to get to the slide deck and so on and so forth. But I'll tell you this. Now, I grew up in litigation, all right? Lawyers all over the family, lucky us. Um, I can tell you that some of the hardest years of my career were as a young lawyer because the pressure is intense. For a lot of people, it may be your first corporate experience. Or for those of you who came out of a different field, academia, government, it may be your first experience dealing with a place that actually has to generate a profit. And um, it may be the first place where you feel like you have performance metrics that you need to meet that are expected of you, that you need to achieve for you to succeed. And you're right if you believe any and all that. So then why is it so hard? I'll tell you why it's so hard. So, first time in a major corporate environment, first time practicing law, still learning the law, and by the way, that never stops, and subject to the mercy of supervisors who may or may not communicate with you 
in the way or style to which you're accustomed and rightly accustomed. And you don't have any control over the deadlines, the clients, the timing, or anything. Well, that sounds terrific to me, but that's, my friends, where you are. And I got through it. I hated every second of having the lack of control, right? The rules get easier. I'm going to talk a bit today about how to make them easier. Calendar control will get easier. I will tell you that there are a few calendar control problems that cannot be fixed. Uh, um, statutes and local rules and codes and notice periods. I could drive a truck through most of those if need be, but you just have to have the knowledge of how to do it. Problem is, when you're the youngest person on the deck, you'll get some sailing anthologies out of me. When you're the youngest, uh, and I'm um, sailing um, metaphors out of me, I should say, when you're the youngest person on the deck, you don't know any of that. And that's just, I have to tell you, how it is, right? But you will get through it. I will offer you this. I would heartily recommend that you put in the time, but, underline the but. If you give it some time, the time will vary. It's up to you. Might be two years, might be four years, might be 20 years, might be 30 years. I don't know. If it stops being fun or at least interesting, you get the hell out and do something else. You only get to do this once. I'm not trying to throw you out of your job, but you only get to do this once. You only get one life. And uh, if it stops being fun, don't do it. Number one rule of holes is stop digging. Hell, we'll turn to the substance of it because I do want to give you as much as I can give you in these 60 minutes. First slide. First impressions are everything. Oh yes, first impressions are everything. There was an old Peanuts cartoon back when cartoons were published in the paper where Linus didn't shine the front of his shoes, he only shined the back. And somebody called him out for it. And he said, I don't care what people think of me when I come into a room. I care what they think of me when I leave. First impressions are everything. And I can promise you, as a longtime partner with clients to take care of, burdens to deal with, and having worked with hundreds of associates in my career, um, if I like you, I'll keep working with you. If I don't, I'll be extremely polite and you'll never hear from me again. If somebody likes your work, they might tell a few people in the firm. If somebody hates your work, they'll tell everybody. First impressions are everything. I put my heart and soul into my years as an associate. And you'd be surprised what kind of a runoff ride you can get from that. Comes back in spades comes back in spades. Now, if you're viewed as in the middle of the pack, you can enjoy the pack and you'll rise and you'll fall with the pack. That's fine. And if you're perceived as uncaring, self-interested, disinterested, intellectually uncurious, kind of a clock stamper, eh, not going to use you. Nobody else will either and um, permission to speak freely to you, you'll be made available to the market. You'll probably make the decision yourself. So, second thing I put on this slide was everyone you'll be working with was a new lawyer once. So I spoke to this when we first started. But you'll see an asterisk on the slide. Asterisk says, 
Some people remember that better than others. Some people, when they rise up in power, they think they were born to it or deserved it or whatever. Well, I have to tell you, at my somewhat advancing age, I still feel like a new lawyer. I still feel like a kid. I still feel like I have so much to learn. Um, you know, I've done tons of stuff for law schools and law students and young associates and that kind of thing. And um, because it's giving back, right? And it's understanding and having been there. So I would urge you, find the people like that in your organization who actually have a heart and don't treat you like a copy machine, if that makes any sense. You will find such people. People talk a lot about mentoring as a young lawyer. Everybody wants mentoring and everybody wants CLE. Everybody wants education, you know, more CLE, more training. I'm going to give you a little inside baseball on that. And again, the views I express are only my own. Mentoring is a two-way street. If you ask the firm to appoint you a mentor and you have lunch every three months, except they'll cancel it most of the time and they'll be off doing this or that, that, that that's not mentoring, right? I can tell you how mentoring actually works. Mentoring is a two-way street. As a shareholder, it is not my obligation to mentor you. You actually have to show, at the very least, an interest. And if you want more, you have to do something for me. Nothing untoward. You just got to be available. You got to be interested. You got to be engaged. You got to care. And then I'll say, this person cares. And then I will share with you the thoughts that you're now getting for whatever the fee associated with this is. That's mentoring. It's a two-way street. It is not an obligation that I owe you. I'm just speaking freely to you, and I hope you don't take this in the wrong way. This presentation is meant with a lot of love. It's meant with a lot of love. It's just the facts. It's just the facts. It's just the facts. How to succeed. Next slide. Prepare in advance. Learn the names and backgrounds of the people for whom you expect primarily to work for. Yes. Don't just say, hey, it's great to meet you. I'm Josh. What's your name? No. You might want to, at the very least, pull up the, the lady's biography and see, that, you know, see what her interests are. Maybe look her up on social media. You know, I, I've made great friends with partners I haven't known very well. Because it turns out we're total lovers of golden retrievers. It's affinity bonding, right? And I don't mean that, you know, affinity bonding is dangerous. In, in, in assignments and staffing, terrible tendencies that have been rightly called out and exposed about people who want to hire people who look like them, act like them, grew up like them, think like them. And that actually has been proven to be very limiting, very limiting. But if you can find a way to connect with the people you're working with in more than a superficial or God help you a supercilious way, uh, I highly recommend that. And I can tell you this, a grateful client is terrific. The only thing better than a grateful client is a grateful partner, right? Clients come and go. It's unfortunately true. It's just how it is. Next point I have, learn, how the, learn who the important clients are. But actually study them a little bit. At least look at their website. You know, pull their 10K or 10Q. Look at it. Show some interest. What's their business model? Read the footnotes in their SEC disclosures. All the interesting stuff is in those footnotes. So you can, that shows that you care. 
and that shows to the people you're working with that you care. This is not billable. Don't you dare put this on a timesheet. You're doing this for yourself. The most valuable work you'll do. Go home, Saturday evening, kids are watching TV. Look up the clients, try to learn something about them. It'll help you a long way, I promise you. Okay, I've already talked about affinities and common experiences, that's fine. Next bullet point I have on this slide, and this is really important, this is really important. Be lovely to staff, okay? You can be the biggest hot shot in the world. Terrific law school. Hired as a first year, making 220 a year, 230, I don't care what. And this person is just a legal assistant. Well, except this person who's just a legal assistant has been there for 35 years. And take my word for it, as an older partner in management, I care substantially more about her or him than I care about you. And if you abuse that legal assistant, I can personally promise you, you will be on the next train out. I'm just telling you that. It comes down to character. Treat everybody. The people with the messengers, the copy people. Act like an officer. You show them the ultimate respect. And people will respect you. And if the staff likes you, word will get around. And if you come in as an associate and you're mean to staff, may the Lord have mercy on you. <coughs> That's just how it is. Rest of the stuff on the slide, self-explanatory. Observe firm culture. Act like others act. <coughs> I put on here, associates have little to gain from being perceived as eccentric. Please don't be eccentric. We have enough problems with lateral partners who are eccentric. The last thing we need is an associate with eccentricity. And I don't care how smart you are. I honestly don't. If you're a pain in the ass, then that's just another burden on our time. I'm just telling you like it is. Adhere to firm cultures and values. Understand what the firm culture is. Take the time to learn the firm culture. Don't just pay it lip service and go to the monthly attorney meetings and smile. Any idiot can do that. Try to study it. So now coming to the nitty gritty, make sure you have clarity on assignments. See, this is very hard, right? Because some partners talk in concentric circles and passive voice and get very distracted and will tell you to do something you have no idea what. I hear these stories all the time, all the time. I have people that say, you know, I got, I got handed this and I didn't know what to do with it. I don't even know who we represent. Well, that's not a failure on your part. It's a failure on their part. The problem is, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Very simple. You ask for clarity in a very nice, polite way, right? So if I understand this correctly, you wish me to research the application of a estoppel after an assertion about the blah, 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 blah. Correct? Right? And if, it, you know, so I say carry a yellow pad everywhere, it looks, you know, carry a tablet, I don't know, carry whatever you want to carry. Um, I will tell you when people walk in with a yellow pad, it always strikes me as courteous because they want to get it right. And then the first thing I tell them is put it away. If I can't frame the issues in things you can understand without writing them down, then I've failed. Then I've failed, right? It's on me. But carry the yellow pad or the tablet. A confirmatory email I put in there. Just a quick thing. Dear Barry, thank you for our meeting this morning. I'm very happy to be assisting, you know, Acme Corporation in its efforts to eliminate Wiley Coyote. As I understand, you would like to know if there are any restrictions on the dropping of anvils on top of coyotes in the state of New Mexico. If I have this wrong, please let me know. Also, when would a response be desired? I will get it to you whenever you need. 
Get clarity on that, right? Okay? Get clarity on that. You want to get clarity on that. And so that goes into the next slide. Be certain to know deadlines and honor them. Some people won't give you deadlines. When possible, I try to say, say they'll say, well, when do you need this? I'll say whenever is reasonable. It's a vague answer, but it means I don't need it very desperately. I'll confess to you with the younger person, I probably know the answer anyway. I just need somebody to give me some case citations. Sorry to tell you. Now, there are emergencies. They do arise. Temporary restraining orders in litigation. Deals, corporate side, bear hugs, leverage buyouts, stuff that's really hellish. Well, I'll tell you this, you know you have a good leader when she stays for 48 hours straight rather than leaving you there by yourself. There are some people who do. There are some people who will never assign you something that they're not able or willing to do themselves. Those are the people you cultivate the relationships with. Those are the people that you cultivate the relationships with. Don't spurn anybody, but it's a sign of character, right? So as you're demonstrating character, they demonstrate it to you. Next slide, working with word processing. You know, this one's, this one's a freebie and I offer it to you. Um, when I had the slide deck prepared, I sent it over to our head of word processing and she asked me if I would please include this because it was so important to her, right? And it didn't really fit with the macro message to me, but consistent with the messaging I'm giving you. I included it. It's all accurate, it's all true. It's all there, it's on the screen, it'll be in your handout, I offer it for your consideration. But it actually serves a more salutary purpose. I included it in the slide deck for the respect reasons that I was speaking to earlier. You see what I'm saying? I could have just told her no, or I could have taken it out. But no, I respect her. It's in the slide deck. Some of this stuff, you know, these are hard messages on the next slide. Don't be too big for your britches. Better to be liked and trusted than to be perceived as a jerk who's a genius. Self-explanatory sentence. I don't have anything to add to it for you. Don't have anything to add to that. Respect the culture. If you find you cannot, find another place to work. Let me tell you, not all firms are terrific, okay? I have had my own experiences with firms that are not terrific. And I shall not go into any details, but I'll offer you this. If you find yourself in a situation where either the internal culture of the firm or the goals of the client or the goals of the partners you're working for or with or however you'd like to put it are inconsistent with your own goals, leave carefully, quietly, onward, and upward, all right? It does happen. You know, people come in as an associate, you know, they come out of law school, they're in a really terrific law school, they got a great transcript, everything looks great, and they look at the firms, they got all the major firms, right? And so, you know, my firm is like, I don't know, whatever it is at the time, uh, number 10 in Los Angeles in terms of size and stuff, and then there's other firms lurking around in the same area. They're very different firms. But nothing looks different on the statistics. The offices are all in nice places. They were all born in 1927 or 1950 or 1890 or whatever. They're all very different firms. And so at a time when the choice of a firm is most important to you professionally and psychologically, you get to do that with the least information. Lucky you. Lucky you. Some choices work out great. Some don't. I offer this to you if you feel that the morals, the business plan of the clients, the ethics of the attorneys are incompatible with your own. 
just do a quiet, polite exit and find a place you like better. That is some of the strongest advice I can give you. You don't want to go home every night and have to take a shower to wash off the effects of your colleagues. I mean that. I mean that. Back to substance. Study the work of the more senior lawyers with whom you're working. Your firm will have a document management system. You know, whether it's iManage or whatever, it doesn't matter. But when you're asked to draft a complaint, answer some interrogatories, do a, you know, do a letter of, uh, you know, a LOI or whatever, you know, so you go to the document repository, right? Uh, electronically, and you'll pull up something and then you'll copy it. And I happen to be of the opinion that, you know, all legal documents that exist in the world can be traced back to some cuneiform and they've all been adapted since then. Um, so you'll go to this and you'll go to the document repository, right? And you'll create a new document from the old document. And um, if you've been properly trained or you're sharp enough to do it without training, uh, then you'll uh, run the uh, thing to remove the metadata so nobody can see the changes because that's always embarrassing. And then you'll walk it into the assigning attorney's office and proudly present it. And this lady or bloke will look at it and they'll say, well, where, where, where'd, where'd you get this from? And you'll say, well, I got it off the system. And then, you'll, and then the, the lady or bloke will say, well, who authored it? And you'll say, Jack Jones. And then this cloud will come over the assigning attorney's face and she or he'll say, Jack Jones is an idiot. Always has been was asked to leave the firm. Why would you choose Jack's work? Now, there's no way you could have known that, right? No way, no chance. My point is, when you go to the document repository, and I truly do not recommend you try to start building agreements on your own, I mean, my Lord. Um, but when you go to the document repository, more recent documents are better than ones from the Kennedy administration. And what's really good are ones that the assigning attorney has done. That's always a sign of intelligence in a younger lawyer. When they not only look for examples, but they look for examples that I signed. Now, I will candidly admit I've probably signed many things I haven't read in detail. But I did sign them. And so when I ask you who drafted this, and you'll say, well, you, you, you did. You did. I'll say, I did? Well, what was the name of the case? And you'll say it was, uh, you know, uh, Roadrunner versus Coyote. And I'll say, you know, I have no recollection of Roadrunner versus Coyote. Did you happen to see how it came out? I'm afraid, you know, after the case is over and the clients move on, I just, I just delete it from the data bank. And you'll say, well, I think you won. Well, I won. Well, gee, this must be a hell of a document. But it makes me personally flattered and also, more importantly for you, comfortable that you got the document from something that I myself had done. Right? It, it, you know, I mean, it may not, may, maybe Jack Jones' document was great. I don't know. But, you know, if I sign something, it's more likely to be comfortable to me. Next bullet point on the slide, when you draft for someone, Try to learn and use their voice. It can vary sometimes obviously, sometimes subtly. Truly, when I write an appellate brief very occasionally, I, um, I've broken the tradition of handing stuff off to the appellate department, although I certainly ask them for the technical things. All the advice you'll get is that uh, the trial lawyer should not handle the appeal. Well, you know, as my family will tell you, I know better than anyone, so I often do it. Um, but when I was writing them for other people, I would take the time to pull up 10 of their recent briefs that they had signed and know the people who drafted them and learn their voice. People speak in different ways. 
I like short declarative sentences because I know that judges have a lot of enormous amount of caseload and short declarative sentences are easier to read, right? Um, and they, they make for a quicker read, right? I usually will ask for a brief without an introduction. I'd rather do the introduction myself. If I'm drafting it from the ground up, I still will not do the introduction until the brief is done. When the brief is done, then I know what I want to put in the introduction. And there are many, they call themselves lexographers, some of them are friends, who make a career out of teaching legal writing, and I have no doubt that you'll be exposed to a number of them, and they charge a pretty penny for it. And they all have their own views on how to do it, and some of them are conflicting, and that's all fine. I have my own style. I try to be very direct, very honest, very simple, and keep the credibility high. But I will admit in the introduction, if I know the justices who are considering it, I may throw in a little bit of spice, right? So a reply brief on a motion for preliminary injunction. First sentence. And it survived all the other people on the team, and it survived the client and actually got filed. It's always a question uh, whether that'll work. The um, opening sentence said something like, despite moving parties, 10,000 plus page opposition brief and evidence. All it did was make the Lorax weep. New paragraph. This is actually a segue to my next point. Save added humor, sarcasm, and vitriol for the most senior lawyer on the team to insert. You know why I love the Lorax quote, the Lorax little vignette that I put in there? Because I wrote the damn thing. And I must tell you, when you're drafting from the ground up, you know, you can take a shot at it. You know, you could say offered for your kind consideration or something. I tend to save the humor for the most senior person and also the vitriol. Um, I mean, judges hate vitriol and ad hominem attacks. It goes back to the don't be too big for your britches thing. And by the way, I'm not trying to be diminutive about this. I'm just speaking about what I see. It's something I have to remind myself of all the time. So I think yeah, as a younger person, you're best served by doing a, uh, as Sergeant Joe Friday said in the, uh, in the old uh, police story show, I think it was, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, just the facts. Just lay it out. Don't color it, just the facts. That's what's appreciated. Do something like that, and then I can do what I will with it. It depends on the judge. I'm just speaking from what I see, what I personally like. Okay, now we're getting into the substance of this. Okay, well, I, I know you thought we were already there, right? But here are the guidelines for really being perceived as somebody with a hope of advancement. In fact, indeed, if you can do this, a likelihood of advancement. So the bullet says, be matter-oriented, not task-oriented. Okay? So here's the whole point. There's a quote attributed to the legendary movie producer Jack Warner, Warner Brothers. And when asked, and it's probably apophrical, okay? But when asked what his idea of good management was, Jack Warner supposedly said, 500 people doing exactly what I tell them to do. Well, if it's true, that might have worked for Jack Warner, but that was a different time. And even then, that's actually not the best way to approach management. What you want to have is competing views. What you want to have are people's thoughts. And a good team leader will encourage that. And a good associate will offer them anyway. In a polite, quiet way, 
Don't stamp your foot. And that's a mistake I made. I stamped my foot when it was really too big for my own britches. I'm speaking from the heart here. I'm speaking from the experience. This is not a wise guy on the mountain talks down to you. This is a guy who made some of these mistakes, okay? So, um, see, when you're working on a matter, whether it's a corporate deal, tax deal, litigation, whatever, so you're brought in for a team and there's a team meeting. The uh, C student will try to figure out what her assignment is and I'll write it down on that yellow pad we talked about. And then we'll take it back to the lovely little office and bang it out in due course and turn it in and put a little check mark next to that and move on. Yeah. Well, look, I was a first year lawyer. I had to pick juries. I didn't know a damn thing about picking a jury. Smaller firm at the time, one you would never have heard of. Trial lawyer said, look, I'm running over three days in my department. Just get a jury. I said, really, get a jury. Not a problem. Any particular jury you'd like? He said, get people you like and trust. Look in their faces. Which, by the way, is a hell of a good way to pick a jury. It's a little tough on you when you've been a lawyer for seven months. Okay? But the point that I'm getting to is you're not working on a task research the laws on dropping anvils on coyotes in the state of New Mexico, right? You're actually working on a case. How do we solve the problems that our client Roadrunner is experiencing? What is the master strategy for Roadrunner's claims against this blasted wily coyote? What does Roadrunner wish to achieve? What are Roadrunner's goals? What is our game plan for moving forward towards those goals? And you're going to say, well, look, I'm the fourth person on the team. You know, I don't know. You know, Bloke is handling it. Bloke's been a lawyer since 1924. Um, I would offer you with the utmost respect that the way to promote up and gain credibility at, and, and, and increase your credibility, increase your stature, and for those of you who may be... Uh, somewhat grounded in monetary avarice, like I've probably been accused to be, the way you get paid more, is even when you're starting out, pretend to yourself like it's your case. You don't have bloke. All you got are you and the roadrunner. So what are you going to do for that flightless bird? It's just you. And that's how you think about it, right? And that's how you add value. And I've had partners struggle with how to convey this. I've seen acronyms like I care. I remember the acronym. I don't remember a damn thing about what it stands for. But the point is the same, right? I'll tell you a story. Major, major case. Corner office, New York firm, very senior partner. Credentials like you wouldn't believe. Plaques all over the walls, accolades, millions of dollars a year. Whole litigation team is in there, some former federal prosecutors. Impressive people, right? They bring the summer associate in to give her a taste. You know, because the summer associate thing, well, this firm did it right and they gave everyone a taste. So this girl's in the room, right? And the senior partner says, any questions? At the end of about an hour-long meeting. And her hand goes up tentatively, and she says, well, I, I do have something, but it's probably stupid, and I don't think I should bother everyone's time. And the uh, senior people, first, appropriately, back to our earlier comment about respect, and secondly, wisely, from what followed, said, no, want to hear what you have to say. What do you see? What do you think? And this 2L says, it just seems to me that when such and such occurred, the court was divested of jurisdiction. 
She was absolutely right. Absolutely right. And all the $1,600 an hour guys in the room, ladies in the room, they didn't see it. Comes out of a 2L. Wow. You think they remember her? Yes. Do you think they resent her? No way. No way. No way. That's what I mean about owning the situation and owning the case. Sometimes you will see things that other people don't see. You will bring fresh perspectives. I got to tell you, 30 years difference between you and me, you got a lot to teach me, right? And I want to learn. I want to learn. But you have to tell me. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And that's how you're more of a team rather than task oriented. You will, you know, it takes me back to the old Al Pacino speech, right? Don't, don't know if you're football folks or not, but the Al Pacino speech, he said, you know what? We will win as a team or we will die separately. And that's what a law firm team is. And I mean this with true sincerity and with the utmost best wishes that you can do it. So um, we've covered a lot of stuff about how to advance yourself in terms of your personal um, experience and in terms of your perception within the firm and in terms of your advancement as a lawyer. Now we get to the tougher slide, which is how to not accidentally commit suicide while you're doing it, right? And I am not going to name specific instances, but I will tell you that I have been the unfortunate witness to many of these, and you truly don't want to be that person. And so that's why I put them up here. And you'll see I noted in the slide the word sentinel event, right? And so I have a healthcare background. And so sentinel event is something in a healthcare provider system where it should never occur, okay? So I could probably, if forced, give you the list off the top of my head, but I'll just give you the highlight film. Operating on the wrong part of the body. Operating on the wrong patient. Prescribing a medicine which conflicts with an existing prescription. Administering a medicine to which the patient is allergic. Assault on a patient by a member of the staff, the medical staff, or, uh, or, or non-professional staff. Those are sentinel events that should never occur. What I'm giving you is a list of the sentinel events in a law firm that should never occur. The consequences are awful. I don't want any of you to be one of those people. Hence why I offer this. Lying. You know, I'll tell you this. It is, and again, I am not speaking for the management of my current firm or firm, former firms. I will tell you this. Mistakes happen, okay? People screw up. You'll be stunned and amazed to know that indeed, even I have screwed up. Wow, shocking. But I'll tell you one thing about screwing up. Confess it immediately to the most senior person on the team because she may know a way to fix it that would never have occurred to you, okay? Would never have occurred to you. And there's a saying, the number one rule of holes is stop digging. So screwing up, it happens, okay? Go to management immediately and describe what happened. That's not a sentinel event. A sentinel event is when management learns about it from some other source or suspects it and then you lie to them. And I must be honest with you, when you lie to the partners in your law firm and you're caught in it, terminado, my friend, that's it. That day, that hour, that minute. That's just how it has to be. Do not lie to management. 
threatening anyone. Please don't threaten anyone. Criminal offense in most jurisdictions. Be very careful in correspondence. There are some lawyers whose names I won't mention that seem to make a career out of threatening people. And, you know, I'm well familiar with the application of California's litigation privilege embodied in Civil Code Section 47C, and it'll get you out of a lot of stuff. But you want to be really careful. You want to make sure it's vetted, right, before you just fire something off. And um, there's also, you know, when you took the MPRE, as everyone has to do, there's always the question about not threatening criminal prosecution or referral to gain a civil advantage. We all know about that one, right? Um, but you also have the possibility of criminal extortion charges. Uh, and I would refer you to Avenatti in the Nike situation. I know Avenatti. Um, there are arguments that could be made about the merits of that case. Um, you don't want to be there, right? Uh, get ethics opinion. Get the most senior person's opinion. I'll add something else on the slide. A lot of people pick on younger lawyers. You know, they throw their weight around, and they hem and they haw, and they huff and they puff, and they'll blow your house down and everything else. Well, that's okay. That's all right. We've all taken it. Um, don't lose it on a phone call or an email. Some very fine firms. I had lawyers that just busted out with a bunch of curses and uh, such in emails. And um, that's delightful for me because I'm an advocate. And if I'm in a particularly bad mood, well, let me put it in the abstract. People have been known to just ship it off to the judge and ask for her counsel on how best to manage the further meet and confer discussions. Yeah. So don't do that. If you think something might be over the edge, don't send it. Probably is, okay? Using firm stationery for personal business disputes. This is great. You're a second year lawyer. UPS didn't deliver your child's bike or whatever. So you take the firm's tombstone stationery with the names of all the partners, goes halfway down the first page, and you file a, fire off a blast-off letter on the firm letterhead to UPS about how despicable and fraudulent they are and everything else. Well, of course, UPS is a firm client, and the fact that your letter threatens suit goes to the legal department, and they have a great laugh. And they send it over to the general counsel, who then sends it over to the relationship partner, who then terminates you. Okay? I've seen that at least twice. Don't do it. Okay? Proud to be a member of this fine law firm, but don't trade my credit for your UPS problem. Again, terminado. Sorry. That's just what happens. Suing a client, same thing. I've seen that. Idiots actually, because of their dispute, and I'm picking on UPS, which is a fine company. I'm just pulling one out of the hat. I could make it the Roadrunner and the Coyote to file a lawsuit because of some perceived grievance in pro per, which of course we all know how to do. But they're suing a client of the firm. Um, comma, no, 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 no. The wise approach, frankly, especially in financial services, I personally don't do any business with firm clients. Now, why don't I do business with firm clients? There's relationships there. Might be profitable for me. Might get favorable this. Might get favorable that. Sure. But it also handcuffs me for advocating for myself if I feel like they've breached an obligation of care. I offer that to you for your consideration. I'm going to skip around 
just a touch. I already did the bottom one, covering up your mistakes rather than quickly and fully reporting them. It's a sign of immaturity, sign of unprofessionalism. And to the extent that your problem with a mistake is X, covering them up, delaying them, etc. It's now X to the second power, X to the third power, on and on. It's geometric. Um, Third-party subpoenas, though, I do want to note. I always send out reminders about this. Um, always send out reminders of this on a periodic basis. You know, we run things through conflicts, right, before we sue somebody, right? It has to go through conflicts. Well, before you fire off a subpoena to UPS in the uh, Roadrunner versus Coyote litigation that you're so ably handling, I guess UPS delivered the anvil, and so you got to beef with them about that. Uh, you got to run it through conflicts, okay? Because UPS might be a firm client. You don't just fire off a subpoena to a firm client. They tend to take offense. And they're usually somewhat sarcastic. That doesn't mean don't advocate for the roadrunner. You owe the roadrunner that obligation. But you also owe UPS the courtesy of letting them know. And that's the relationship partner for UPS. You see what I mean? Um, because I've seen circumstances where people fire off those subpoenas and what usually happens is someone in the legal department at the company, right, sends it over to the relationship partner at your firm with a little note saying, can your folks handle this? And it's obviously very sarcastic. Um, anyway, don't be that person, okay? Being tricked into conflicting out the law firm. This is a dirty little secret, okay? Um, I've seen it happen. And usually it's done to the younger people. You hear about the focus on client development, and building relationships, and that kind of thing, right? So it'll be about 8.30 in the morning. You'll get a call out of the blue. Julie, this is Mr. Coyote. So I saw your profile online. I saw that you spoke at the Anvil Convention in Phoenix last month. And I have a problem involving an Anvil. And I'm looking for counsel. Do you have time to speak with me? And of course you're going, wow, this is great, man. You know, this is, this is terrific. New client, man. I'm generating business. This is fabulous, right? What Mr. Coyote is doing is picking on the youngest person in the herd to conflict the law firm out of representing your longtime client, Roadrunner, okay? And they're picking on you because you're the easy mark, okay? And it's a strategy. It's actually legal. So after you say, yes, uh, Mr. Coyote, I'm, I'm you're sure, I mean, absolutely. Let me, let me get my yellow pad. I, somebody told me to carry a yellow pad. Let me get my yellow pad and I'll take some notes. Thank you so much, Julie. So here's what's going on. I got this anvil and it hit me in the head and I really think it's unfair. And, you know, I have to tell you just confidentially, I, I have a problem with anvils. You know, I have a, we have an anvil history in my family and anvils make me nervous. So I'm going to share, Mr. Coyote is going to share with you a bunch of confidential information, right? Well, now, then, after about five minutes of that, which he's documenting, of course, because he's a smart coyote, he's a wily coyote, he thanks you for your time. He says, I'll be in touch. And he does it with five other law firms. Do I know of people who have done this? Do I know of people in these situations who have identified the go-to law firms for the roadrunner and deliberately conflicted them out? to make life harder for the roadrunner? Oh, comma, boy, period, hard stop. Correct response with a new client is, please don't tell me any confidential information. I'm very interested in helping you to the extent it's possible, but I need to run a conflicts check before. May I call you back at this number? Or words to that effect. Uh, otherwise, You'll be very popular at the associate review meeting as the guy that uh, conflicted the firm out of the Roadrunner case. Okay, enough said. More Sentinel events being the good news guy. But again, 
trying to save your life and your career here, okay? Harsh social media postings. Please, 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 please don't, okay? Um, so my name is Andrew Struby, right? I live in Newport Beach, California. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. No, I'm sorry, actually you can't. I deliberately don't do that. Deliberately don't do that. Because there are people who are political operatives or social operatives who will use that against you and expose you to your firm's management. And it is not pretty. Next category, actually very compelling right now given that the uh, Supreme Court, as I recollect, has decided to review uh, the law regarding um, disclosure of uh, contributions to organizations, to initiatives, political campaigns, they already have to be disclosed. I know of some very well-intentioned people who belong to certain religious groups where one of their core foundations is their religion follows certain precepts um, which are in conflict with other closely regarded and widely held uh, views on a particular social issue, okay? Those donor lists, depending on the state of the law at whatever moment you're watching this, may or may not be public. But I've had situations where I've had partners, senior partners, publicly shamed to the entire firm for donating money to cause X or cause Y. Certainly, campaign finance laws will govern. And I wouldn't say that maybe my wife with her own last name might donate money here or there. I don't know about that. But you see what I'm saying? It's very hard for everyone. Use of research tools for improper purposes. So, your neighbor has a gripe. Um, I'll leave the road running and the coyote alone. Your neighbor has a gripe with another person. Your neighbor wants some intel on that other person. So sure, you know, what the hell? You got a Westlaw password, you fire up Westlaw, you check all the boxes and you run a comprehensive criminal and civil and credit database search and everything else. Well, you violated a whole bunch of laws and it's also directly traceable to you. Oh, by the way, now you have a client, the person who asked you to do it. Of course, it's a client you didn't clear conflicts with and it's a non-remunerative client. But uh, other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was Dallas? Uh, no, that's not why you have the Westlaw password. Please, 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 please. Don't give it away. The Westlaw password is firm property. It's not yours to give away. It's not for the fun and enjoyment of friends, okay? Expensing stupid things or extravagant things. So listen, right? Um, there are clients who will pay for first-class airfare. There are some clients I've had that insist on first-class airfare. You have to know who your client is, okay? You have to know what they do, right? Uh, sometimes I'll put in an engagement letter, Mr. Struby travels in the highest class of service. However, he does not bill for his in-flight time. Whatever, whatever your firm policy is, etc. But if you're not clear on your firm policy, this is a real story, right? Very senior partner and a young associate hop on a flight for the coast, right? Well, a senior partner booked himself in coach. Associate booked, booked himself in first or business, I can't remember which. And so they're kind of breaking up in the jetway, right? The associate suddenly realizes what he's done and says, really, you should take this seat. Well, senior partner has been litigating for 40 years and knows how to drive a point home. Says, no, really, you should. It's obviously far more important to you than it is to me. And it was left at that. Don't be that person, right? Openly using a client 
competitor's product or services, you know, I see it so often and it's just felony stupid. It's just brain dead, okay? Uh, look, geez, I even put the name in there. We'll say it's hypothetical. So if m and Mars were a major client of your firm, and we're paying you enormous amounts of money, right? And you got your little candy bowls out there in reception. May I humbly suggest that you don't put Nestle candy in them? When Coke is a major, another, this is a true story, Coke is a major client of the firm, could you please not have Pepsi in the damn vending machine? I mean, this is really simple stuff, right? But people don't think about it. And one of my favorite ones, it's absolutely true. Send overnight legal documents to your client FedEx via UPS next day air. What are you, nuts? I mean, it's obvious until you do it by accident. You might not do it deliberately, but please spare yourself the pain and the angst. And by the way, all these sentinel events that I talked about, these are all true stories. And some of them I've seen more than once. So easy to avoid. Offered for your kind consideration. So we've got about five minutes. I'm going to run through these quickly. Um, and I'll skip some of it. I'll try to deliver what I think is most important to you. There will be requests for self-evaluative memos. You write a memo about what you've done at the end of every six months or at the end of the year, right? Put time into it. Don't dash it off. We get those in binders. I would get three binders of them, the big binders with all the tabs. And let me tell you, some people work really hard on those. And some people, it reads like they wrote it on the subway. And if you don't think we can tell, oh boy, we can tell. Don't, you know, and I've had equity partners who said, I'm the smartest lawyer in this firm. Well, you're the something in this firm. I'm not sure about that one. Um, put some time into it, reflect on them, draft them in advance. It also helps. It's not just an exercise for us. It's an exercise for you. It helps define your future of who you want to be. So I would really uh, offer that to you as a tip. Never too early to make plans for the future. It's never too early to make plans for the future. Uh, towards the end of every year is a good time for reflection. It's a time to make a checklist. And I know it may sound trite. Make a checklist of things you want to accomplish in that year to come, that calendar year to come. And then keep it on your desk, right on your desk. Force yourself to do it. Force yourself to look at it. I think <clears throat> no matter what your hours, expectations are, whatever, I set aside a half an hour every workday to spend some kind of time with a current or future client. Just have to do it, all right? I will tell you candidly, um, unless you're in the very rarefied airs of some very special law firms. There is no client fairy, okay? There is no client fairy, all right? There's no Easter Bunny. You actually have to do it. And when's the best time to start doing that? Hum, gee, I don't know, how about now? All right, so I offer that to you. Uh, keep in mind that your colleagues will not be there forever. We discussed you might not be at the firm forever. Who knows? It's your choice. <coughs> or hopefully it's your choice. People will go to other places. Some of them will go in-house. Some of them may wind up being close friends. Some of them may wind up being your best client for 20 years of your life. Wow. And you know what? I can tell you from experience. You'll never know who it's going to be. It could be the most random thing in the world. You just need to understand that, okay? I'm going to skip the thing about doing time entries. It's a subject many people have covered. It could be its own presentation. Be a willing participant in firm activities, even when they're bothersome, non-billable, or often both. Boy, take my word for it. If I had a buck for every plane I've gotten on when I didn't wish to get on a plane every weekend I've missed, um, you got to do it, right? Firm's a family. 
If you're invited to be part of the family, you actually have to go to the family dinner. It's really simple stuff. Okay? Establish your own value, your own identity. Figure out who you are, who you want to be, and how you present yourself within the firm. Build your brand. You may not know it, but you have a valuable brand. Identify it internally and then live it. So I wish you all my personal best. And um, if any of this was useful, um, my time was well spent. Thank you for your time.